disappeared. Oh. Okay, let's get going. Thanks for coming. Uh, very happy today to have uh, Professor Laura Wardrop from UIC UC. Uh, Laura received her uh, PhD uh, in astronomy and space physics in Boston University in 2004. Uh, then he joined the uh, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at UIUC, uh, first as an uh, NSF uh, CDAR postdoc, uh, where he current, she currently is an assistant professor. And uh, her research is focused on the development of novel ground and space-based uh, sensing modalities for uh, estima estimation of key physical parameters of uh, space uh, plasma environment and also on the modeling of uh, radiative transfer and uh, photochemical processes. Uh, she has served as a member of the CEDAR uh, uh, steering committee and uh, later as a rotating advisor uh, to the NSF AGS division, which is also called an expert. Uh, she has also served as a chair of the uh, science advisory committee for our CBO observatory and currently is uh, uh, HAO's adv uh, external advisory. Uh, committee board. Laura? Thank you, Henry. And thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so I've, I've chosen an image. Turn your mic on. So thank you, Hunley, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. I've chosen an ambitious topic for this seminar. Uh, it, it's uh, near and dear to my heart in the sense that it's it's estimation of key physical parameters in the near space environment. Uh, but this this one in particular, uh, atomic hydrogen density. Uh, velocity distributions, these kinds of parameters are notoriously hard to measure. And so what I'll be talking about are the various techniques that have been developed, uh, what the current status of those techniques is, and where do we, where do we go from here. So I, I won't be spending too much time talking about the physics of it, just enough to give a, a broad overview um, uh, for context. Uh, but the, the basic idea behind this, this uh, research is that the terrestrial hydrogen population is, uh, everyone knows that we don't know it well. You know, it's one of those things Donald Rumsfeld would have called a known unknown. We have, we have no idea, and, and we know that we don't do a good job with it. Uh, in fact, I, I don't want to single out uh, the, the Kibbleson and Russell textbook here, but this is a very typical example of, of the way hydrogen is depicted in, in uh, coursework, essentially, and, and that's that it's hardly mentioned at all. So you can see, uh, the, I've, I've highlighted it in red here, this is the altitude distribution of neutral species in the Earth's atmosphere. This is the well-mixed region below about 100 kilometers. And then it separates into diffusive equilibrium, hydrostatic uh, equilibrium profiles characterized by a temperature-dependent scale height, where the scale height itself is, is unique for each one of the masses. Um, and you can see here's the hydrogen coming along. And then it just sort of peters out. You know, don't really know what's happening there at low altitudes. Uh, this textbook doesn't inform that. And then here, where you see that in fact, the, the, uh, there's an ionosphere embedded in that neutral uh, thermosphere region. Uh, the, this is the F region peak here, around 250 kilometers. This is created, of course, through photoionization by the neutrals, of the neutrals. Uh, hydrogen is nowhere to be found. And, and it's true that it's a minor species uh, throughout much of this region, certainly at the low altitudes. But it, it's increasingly dominant. And in fact, you know, I would even argue that uh, it doesn't take long at all. It's, it could even potentially be below 1,000 kilometers where uh, hydrogen actually becomes the dominant species and then extends out into a cloud that is observable out to at least 20 Earth radii, tens of thousands of kilometers. And so the question is, you know, what is the density? What is the temperature, if you can even call it that, at these altitudes? And I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, it's, it's certainly something that's not well known. One of the reasons for that is that it's, it's very, very complicated. This is a hard problem. Uh, to, to wrap uh, the head around, uh, particularly if you want to do it rigorously. So just to give you an overview, as I mentioned, this will be broad because I, I want to talk about the, the observing techniques in particular. Uh, but the idea is that you know, it's produced at low altitudes. You have photoionization of water and methane, produce quite a lot of hydrogen. There's other chemical reactions I'll talk about later. Uh, but this happens in the mesosphere, lower thermosphere. Uh, it generates essentially a peak, a chemical uh, production peak around 90 kilometers, uh, and then it experiences a vertical transport. So it's not in hydrostatic equilibrium, diffusive equilibrium. You can see diffusive equilibrium profile. Uh, this, is, this is what that low altitude of H looks like, uh, going up to 500 kilometers here. It's not in a diffusive equilibrium profile. In fact, it has a, a much larger density than that would uh, suggest. 
And, uh, but it is thermalized. So in the, in the, in the thermosphere in this region, uh, it experiences frequent collisions, primarily with oxygen atoms. And so its velocity distribution is well characterized by a Maxwellian. You can call it as having a temperature. Uh, but what ends up happening, of course, is that eventually the collisions die out in favor of, uh, well, I should say they, they die out in general. They become less and less frequent, particularly with respect to the scale height itself. And so at the altitude where the scale height equals the essentially mean free path from collision to collision, call that the exobase. And typically, the way that hydrogen is treated is that it is fully collisional below the exobase and fully collisionless above. And this is a very arbitrary and artificial uh, way of dealing with the, with, with the problem. But here you can see the exobase. In this case, it's around 475 kilometers. Uh, it is, of course, temperature and therefore uh, seasonally variant solar cycle variant. Uh, seasonally meaning spatially variant. So what happens above the exobase? Well, uh, at this point, the exosphere is definitely not Maxwellian. Uh, certainly, it's governed by gravity, kinetic theory. Gravity would be the dominant force there. And so you expect that you would have some ballistic particles. This is, here's the critical level, also known as exobase, and critical level here. Uh, what's typically done is that you partition the velocity distribution function into its dynamical components. You have ballistic particles where they're generated uh, essentially through collisions with oxygen atoms, for instance, in the thermosphere below the exobase. They travel above the exobase on these ballistic trajectories and then fall back down and maybe experience some more collisions down at that lower altitude again. Now, I have drawn here, they're drawn here symmetrically, but of course there's latitude uh, variations, there's diurnal variations. In other words, the exobase is not uniform. So that this population in the, in the Maxwellian velocity distribution space is not a symmetric distribution. Uh, meanwhile, escape would then follow hyperbolic trajectories. Again, you can model this as a truncated Maxwellian distribution because you expect to have an outward going escape population, but you don't have a captured interplanetary population. It doesn't exist. So this is this incoming portion down here would be the part of the Maxwellian distribution that is simply neglected. It doesn't exist. Meanwhile, there are these uh, flyby components. This is the phi four here. Those don't exist too much. And in other words, they would have a, a, a gravity assist flyby of the Earth. Uh, but what does exist in, in, in a dynamical space, but not in the collisional model, is what's known as satellite particles. And so satellite particles are ones which are gravitationally bound. They have elliptical orbits. But that orbit doesn't intersect the exobase. It's the, the perigee of these satellite particles is above the exobase itself. So how do they even get there? You need to have some sort of collision above the exobase that would put them into those orbits. So this, the contemporary, the, the, I should say, the classical collisionless model doesn't account for this portion of the velocity distribution function. Uh, now, another concept of the classical, this escape here, this escape flux, is driven by thermal evaporation. In other words, you have this Maxwellian distribution at low altitudes. Some portion of that distribution, the, the radially uh, outward moving portion, is at speeds above the gravitational escape speed. They will escape Earth's gravity. Now, once they escape, they're gone. So that, again, truncates the Maxwellian. You no longer have a, a true Maxwellian. Uh, there's some issues here I'm, I'm not talking about, about the supply, uh, potentially sluggish even, supply from lower altitudes. Uh, limiting the amount that's even able to escape. But nonetheless, that evaporation, that upward thermal flux, also known as Jean's flux, uh, is classically viewed to be the driver of the structure, of exospheric structure above this exobase level. So you have these ballistic particles and you have escaping particles. But what actually happens, and this is becoming increasingly uh, appreciated by, by researchers in this area, is that charge exchange with ambient ions. These could be topside ionospheric hydrogen and oxygen ions. They could be in the polar cap uh, and also in the plasma sphere. Even solar wind ions outside of the magnetopause. Keep in mind, the magnetopause is you know, 10, 10 or so Earth radii well inside this cloud of hydrogen. So there's, there's quite a lot of charge exchange that happens at the magnetopause itself. These charge exchange reactions essentially create an energized, kinetically energized neutral. Right? The electron jumps from the hot ion, sorry, from the cold neutral to the hot ion. That 
kinetic energization of that hot ion, which is now neutral, it, it keeps its kinetic energy that it had before. So it was spiraling along magnetic field lines. Now all of a sudden, it has this ballistic trajectory and flies off in whatever direction it had right at the moment of that charge exchange. The cold neutral is now a cold ion, but it's very rapidly accelerated with Lorentz forces. So uh, it's essentially, this is a, a source of energy loss for the plasma itself. But in, as far as hydrogen is concerned, this is where those satellite atoms come from. Uh, it also enhances escape. This is a polar wind is, is an issue here. So the question really is, how are these two parameters or two processes balanced? Is this one dominate the other? How do we model these things? Uh, meanwhile, there's another complication, which is that uh, solar radiation pressure is not negligible, particularly for these satellite atoms, which these the lifetimes of atoms on these orbits can be months or years. These, these are quite, quite long times. Uh, and so solar radiation pressure can actually, and this is something that's difficult to model as well, uh, perturb the orbit such that it, it causes a Sun-Earth alignment in this cloud of hydrogen around Earth. And, and for a long time, they thought it was mostly existing in the, in the tail, much like a magneto tail. But now we see that there's an enhancement on the day side as well. So these, these, uh, these properties are very difficult to model. Uh, most modeling efforts start with uh, essentially the collisions is something that I think a lot of people here are very familiar with, do a, a reasonably good job of at lower altitudes. And the question is, how do you transition into higher altitudes? The kinetic theory at high altitudes, when you're dealing with pure gravity, that's fine if it's collisionless. But there's a transition. It's not a discrete uh, altitude where this you, you switch from, you know, you neglect one term in your Boltzmann equation on the lower altitude side, and you neglect the other term at the high altitude side. It doesn't quite work like that. And so far, a rigorous uh, kinetic theory has not been developed for hydrogen yet. Uh, this is what the uh, this is the, the actual altitude distribution, what it looks like for thermal evaporation only, and I'll talk more about that later. But there are uh, this is essentially MSIS down here at these low altitudes. Here's the exobase right about here and here. You can see there's day and nighttime uh, variations. Uh, daytime are the solid day and night are daytime is the gray lines, and then the nighttime is the is the black lines. And what you see is that the solar cycle variation is larger than the day-night variation. Uh, but you know, it, it essentially, there's a power law decay. And I'll talk about that, too. That's essentially what's predicted at these, at these high altitudes. Uh, the, the trouble is that what's predicted is not what's observed. And there's not a lot of models, because they're hard to make. But nonetheless, there's, there's been some effort to, to predict these exospheric densities. Uh, one is a Monte Carlo model uh, at very high altitudes. Uh, this was developed by. Um, this is Hodges, essentially, a 1994 paper, uh, put out these results where, in this case, you take the Hodges model uh, and you predict what uh, airglow brightnesses you would see. And this is, a, I'll talk a lot more about these airglow emissions later. Uh, but the idea is that the, that the model right now overestimates a key observable. And is that because it overestimates the density? Probably. Uh, when you look at the actual uh, data itself, what I'm showing here are contours of constant density as observed. This is the, this is the sort of the best data we have uh, in the outer exosphere. You'll notice that there are no contours inside of three Earth radii. So we're talking about huge distances from the planet. But if you look at these contours, these are derived from TWINS data, NASA TWINS data. Uh, the left-hand side over here, these two panels are taken from one of the twin satellites, so not utilizing its stereoscopic capabilities. One twin satellite, one day of data. On this side is a multi-year seasonal average utilizing the stereoscopic capabilities. And what you see is that, OK, here's that Sun-Earth alignment. You know, In general, this, this has some, some agreement. But in one day, the, the geocorona uh, doesn't even show Sun-Earth alignment. You know, there, there's clearly some kind of temporal variation going on here. This is completely not accounted for uh, in any existing model. Uh, and then furthermore, it's not exactly obvious from these plots. But there's a dawn dusk asymmetry as well that is uh, something that is right now not explained. It's, it's a very significant around the factor of, of 3 to 5, uh, including as it gets lower down to almost a factor of 10, dawn dusk asymmetry. Uh, 
And so the question is, you know, what's going on? Probably it's the role of charge exchange uh, that's not being modeled well. Um, it could be the fact that we're also not modeling well the exobase variations, the spatial variations, diurnal variations. There's lateral flow uh, that I didn't mention. There's a lot of complicating factors here. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, it's something that's important to uh, keep pursuing uh, because it turns out that the hydrogen population is actually, I would argue, very important for numerous solar terrestrial uh, research topics. Uh, on the one hand, I think there's a, granted it's slow, but hydrogen escape is, is literally a water molecule that will no longer be water, right? You're, you take your H2O and you lose your hydrogen to space and you're left with some O, but you can't drink the O. And so this is a, a permanent evolution in the atmosphere. Uh, there's a lot of, this is relevant to uh, essentially planetary evolution in general, looking at other planets, how did Mars lose its water, that kind of thing. Uh, in the lower atmosphere, uh, hydrogen reacts with ozone. And this is a, a tremendous source of, of heating in the MLT. It's very difficult to do MLT modeling properly without knowing the hydrogen density uh, correctly. Uh, meanwhile, it also the hydrogen also leads to uh, very uh, bright and, and u highly utilized OH emission uh, band structure. Uh, above the F region peak in the ionosphere, the ionization of hydrogen contributes the most to total electron content. Total electron content is something that uh, is, you can measure it with GPS receivers. It's something that we need to be able to predict uh, for space weather. Uh, highly variable uh, effects communication, uh, navigation systems, that kind of thing, any, any radio communication. Uh, so in uh, understanding the hydrogen at these high altitudes is, is important for that. The fourth bullet here should really be the first, because I think this is the most uh, salient reason to study it. Uh, I mentioned that the charge exchange process generates a hot neutral, and that's a sink of energy. This is the, the major source of magnetospheric energy dissipation following geomagnetic storms. And in fact, uncertainties, current uncertainties in the hydrogen density lead to up to uh, essentially doubling or halving of the ring current decay times, uh, an uncertainty of 100%. And so this is, this is very significant uh, for the magnetospheric community, being able to get these densities right. Beyond the fact that in order to even invert ENA images, right? There, there's missions that have ENA cameras on them, like twins or image. In order to invert that image to image the ring current, you need to know the hydrogen density. And right now, they're using a spherically symmetric density with a simple power law decay. Obviously, it's not right. So, so even the, the validity of their ENA imaging uh, techniques are, are in question. And then finally, this is something that folks here know a lot more about. Uh, and have been working on actively uh, recently is the fact that the, the density is sensitive to greenhouse gas emissions. So you double methane, CO2, you're going to perturb the hydrogen density in the middle atmosphere. Uh, and it may be that hydrogen is so sensitive that we can use it, assuming we can sense it properly, that we can use it as an indicator of, of anthropogenic climate change, long-term evolution uh, on time scales, obviously shorter than the, than the H escape time scales. So there's lots of reasons to study it, uh, and there's many techniques that have been developed. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll be describing those. Uh, there's three primary categories of techniques. The first one is potentially the best, but it's also the least utilized. And that's sending up a mass spectrometer into space and just counting. It's particle counting, counting what's there. Uh, there have only ever been two that I know of. Uh, one launched in 2013. This is a Canadian space agency satellite. It was a partnership with tele telecommunications satellite. Uh, it's a small satellite, so these things can be done on a small scale. Uh, but this EPOP, Enhanced Polar Alpha Probe, EPOP had a uh, essentially a micro channel plate imaging sensor. So you ionize the neutrals as they come in. This included H, included O. Ionize the neutrals as they come in, and then you pass them through a magnetic field. The Lorentz force acceleration will bend essentially curve the trajectory then, uh, its energy will set its radius, well, mass to charge also. Uh, and then depending on where it falls on the plate, that will give you the mass separation. This is a, a common thing. But it's, it's a, uh, essentially a circular aperture and a circular sensor. And so you can actually also tell the angle at which the, the particles uh, 
entered, and so you can talk about the angular distribution, velocity distributions. Uh, this is a sensor. It's developed uh, by a Japanese team. As far as I know, there's no papers out on this data, but it is still collecting data. The other one is uh, NSF-sponsored small satellite. This is a, a mission that I was personally involved in um, on the science team. This is a gated time of flight sensor. So in this case, you set, uh, essentially, you, you again ionize the neutrals in an ionizing chamber. You accelerate them through a, a very large potential drop. And then time their arrival. So the fastest ones that arrived, the ones that arrived first were the lightest, essentially. That would be the hydrogen and, and so forth. Uh, this is something where uh, this was launched in, in 2015. I mentioned that we lost contact in August. The truth is uh, we only ever got one spectrum, and it was still during outgassing. So we don't actually have any data from that. But the good news I've heard since I was last here and gave you an update on ExoCube is that we have been given the green light to launch our ground instrument. So we had made two. And we'll be launching that one, uh, I think, sometime in the next uh, year, maybe 18 months. So that's going to be heading back up there again. Goddard is very much involved in this. They developed the sensor. And my understanding is their goal is to uh, put as many of these in space as possible. They're very tiny. They're a 1U sensor. This is something very different from the Atmospheric Explorer type sensors that were gigantic mass spectrometers. So just the miniaturization alone uh, is a big deal. Uh, but nonetheless, there, there are some caveats here. Estimation would, of course, be limited along the satellite trajectory, uh, meaning in the thermosphere, low Earth orbit. And uh, those of you, I'm sure many of you work with low Earth orbit satellite data. It's very difficult to distinguish spatial and temporal variations when you're talking about an in situ measurement as opposed to a remotely sensed measurement. So it's a caveat, but nonetheless, this would be the ground truth. And, and this is something that's very uh, active uh, currently. An another technique that's, that's also currently active is parametric ex estimation. Uh, the idea here is that you have a chemical equation. You think you really understand the, the physics or the chemistry of what's going on. You measure everything else in the equation except for your one unknown, which is hydrogen density. And then you simply solve for it. Uh, and propagate your errors and hope that they're not too big. So uh, in MLT, the, the photochemistry, photochemical equations serve this purpose. Uh, there's two different, essentially, categories. In the daytime, you look at the hydrogen atoms reactions with uh, ozone. I mentioned this generates OH emission. It's vibrationally excited. So it gives off the, the band emission. It also generates O2. And you solve the volume emission rate equation in terms of all its reaction rates and the different uh, populations of the states of OH, et cetera, you solve the volume emission rate equation in terms of unknown H by measuring every other term in that equation, uh, namely O3 density, et cetera. Uh, at nighttime, you assume that O3 is in photochemical steady state. So again, there's a, there's a loss process here of O3, and then recombination would be its production. You balance the production and the loss, solve for H. This is currently being done and has been done uh, since uh, 2001 by the NASA's time satellite, the SABRE instrument. Uh, this is Marty Milnzak's work. Um, and the, the, the only caveat with this, because as I understand it, these are very high quality. This is very high quality data. One of the only caveats is that it's limited to 90 kilometers. You only get estimates in the MLT. This doesn't tell you anything about what's happening in the exosphere or even in the upper thermosphere. Uh, obviously, you're going to need to know all of these other parameters. So it's not the kind of thing that you can do without uh, kind of a large designated mission. Uh, but nonetheless, time saver seems to be going strong. So we expect this to be uh, a, a resource going forward. Uh, another technique, this is something that I myself have worked on uh, at uh, Arecibo Observatory while I was there, uh, is to look at the continuity balance of protons. So protons are almost exclusively created and destroyed through charge exchange. Uh, in the case, the, produced with the O plus and H reaction, uh, produces H plus. So this is a loss for H. And then uh, the loss of H plus is the charge exchange with O. This is a nearly resonant charge exchange reaction, so that neither uh, none of the products become terribly energized. It doesn't affect, essentially, the Maxwellian distribution. Uh, but nonetheless, these terms over here, uh, flux gradients, can be important. I'll, I'll mention that. But you simply solve for H. 
Now, of course, I'm neglecting ionization. Ionization would be a loss process for, I should say, it's a source process for H plus, loss process for H. You would, that would only be operative on the day side, and it would only be if it competes with the charge exchange, so really only at high altitudes where you have low oxygen densities. Uh, so here's the formulation solving for H, and I'll note that, you know, where do you get these measurements from of, of the ions and the oxygen density and so forth? Uh, MSIS, the original MSIS model formulation, got these from Atmospheric Explorer data. Atmospheric Explorer had a mass spectrometer on it. It didn't measure H. H has never been measured at these altitudes ever directly. Uh, and with MSIS, it simply assumed that charge exchange equilibrium was operative. So it completely neglected this term. Uh, my work at Arecibo has shown that the flux gradients, this is essentially pl transfer, plasma transfer between the ionosphere and the plasmasphere, cannot be neglected whatsoever, especially on the night side. Uh, I, I direct you to the, to the work for that evidence. Uh, so there's some caveats to the, to the MSIS. This might explain why MSIS is, is so poorly reproduces the data. Uh, but again, this, this technique, it's, it's promising, but at the same time, it's limited. Obviously, you need to know all of these various uh, parameters in your, in your parametric estimation equation. Uh, and then meanwhile, how you get those parameters limits the applicability of this technique. So if you're getting them from an in situ mass spectrometer, again, you have the same uh, problem that your mass spectrometer is going to be limited in altitude. Uh, and, and meanwhile, climatology is difficult to unravel. Uh, if you get it from, in, in my case, I got it from incurrent scatter radar. Arecibo Observatory is the largest single dish radio telescope in the world. It's extremely sensitive. It can distinguish not just the light ions from oxygen ions, but the light ions, hydrogen and helium, from one another. You get dis actually distinct ion velocities for the two light ion species. H plus was measured. There's no neutral H measured. That's exactly right. That's right. That's exactly right, Stan. That's right. So yeah, it's the it's the hydrogen density that's never been measured directly, except maybe by Casio satellite. But like I said, those results haven't been published. Uh, but it, if it's if you're going to use the incurrent scatter radar, and and I could talk about where the oxygen density estimate comes from. That would be a whole other seminar. Uh, but if you use the incurrent scatter radar, this only works over certain ground-based locations. So it's it's obviously not not a, a long-term solution. Yeah. Uh, so what's the lifetime of uh, Oh, that's a good question. Uh, gosh, that's a very good question. I don't know off the top of my head. I don't have a good sense of that. Um, it would be relatively short. It's a very efficient charge exchange reaction. Well, this this charge exchange reaction. Um, Of an individual hydrogen, hydrogen gas and the bulk flow, right? Which is not the same thing because it's always being created inside the system. Exactly. I mean, this is a this is a nearly uh, resonant reaction, um, and and so it's also going to depend, of course, on where in the thermosphere you are. I mean, if oxygen density is high, it'll it'll happen a lot faster. Yeah, I was asking because uh, in this equation, you don't consider the transport. Maybe there's already an assumption there that it's, it's fast, but I don't know how fast, uh, say, compared to the transport. Well, this, so this is the proton, but this is proton continuity equation. So here's the proton transport, okay. right? And there is significant proton transport. This isn't the neutral hydrogen continuity okay. equation, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. I think around the transition altitude between O plus and H plus, where they're roughly equal, the lifetime's on the order of an hour. No. OK. So the, the bottom line, though, is that these, these techniques, in situ sensing, parametric estimation, uh, they're very much localized, and, and they're very much dependent on many other parameters that you need to know. Uh, a lot of them require satellite deployments and so forth. Uh, there are, there's another class of techniques, and I'll spend the rest of the, of the seminar talking about this class, where it's a remotely sensed, uh, even more so than than the parametric estimation here. It's a, it's a true remote sensing in the sense that it takes advantage of the air glow emissions that H emits. Uh, this is, I call it the gold standard because this has been done for uh, 
for decades, uh, predicted even long before that. And there's really two emissions of record here. One is in the visible regime. This would be the Balmer alpha emission. So this is the transition from the n equals 2 to n equals 3 energy level uh, in the Balmer series here. And then the other is the Lyman alpha. So this is the visible regime. This would be an ultraviolet, far ultraviolet emission here between the ground state and the, the first excited state, 12-16 uh, nanometer emission. Uh, both of these are generated through either resonant scattering, resonant fluorescence of, of the solar Lyman line. So they're very bright on the day side. Multiple scattering allows for emission to be generated on the night side in the Earth's shadow as well. So Balmer Alpha, for instance, can be observed throughout the night. Uh, it is very faint, however. So when I say faint, um, I'm referring to a few Rayleigh's, Rayleigh's being 10 to the 6 photons per centimeter squared per second. Uh, maybe it goes down to maybe three Rayleigh's, very faint, whereas Lyman Alpha is tens of thousands of Rayleigh's. Uh, the trouble is that Balmer Alpha can be observed from the ground, being visible, but being uh, ultraviolet emission, Lyman Alpha must be observed, observed from space. The O2 layer, essentially, uh, absorbs it fully below 80 kilometers. So you have to get a, above that height. Now, the multiple scattering is, is tricky. Uh, it's especially important uh, below around 3 RE is, is typically taken, maybe 3.5, 4 RE, typically taken as, the, as a transition between where you can assume that it's optically thick at the low altitudes and optically thin at the high altitudes. Optically thin meaning that you can assume that only one scattering of that solar photon took place. And if you're measuring it, it scattered it from the sun directly into your detector. And that's a, it's a very easy problem to solve relative to the multiple scattering where it's scattered many times and your source is not just the sun, but your source is scattering from every other hydrogen atom in the medium. This is a, that's a tricky problem, a radiative transfer problem. Now, with this uh, tight remote sensing technique, though, we now have the possibility of investigating the velocity distribution itself because we can look at the line shape and not just the overall line intensity, which would be proportional then to the density. But the line shape would give you information about the velocity. Now, I mentioned optically thin being the easiest to interpret. Uh, this would be the emission for resonance scattering emission model. Here is your measured intensity. You're sitting at a vantage, R0, looking in a direction in hat. Uh, your emissions proportional to the incident solar flux. Uh, it's proportional to uh, cross section, uh, which is a known quantity. This would be the total cross section frequency integrated, but then inside here would be uh, essentially an emission line shape. Now, the emission line shape, I don't want to talk too much about this. Uh, what's historically done is that you assume that the emission line was generated by a Maxwellian distribution. It's not. Um, I've got a paper, it's submitted. Uh, where we consider kappa distributions, actually, because that's what the plasma is doing, and it's assuming it's charge exchanging with the plasma. This function right here is essentially a convolution of the velocity distribution with the rest profile, the the, the rest profile of the Lorentz profile of the of the atom itself. But that's where the shape comes from. Here's the density, and here you can see it's a linear dependence, very convenient. Uh, scattering phase function, it's not a big deal. That's something also that's known. And then we're integrating over the line of sight. So the idea is that I'm measuring the density, uh, measuring the intensity, and I want to find out what is the density. Uh, I could even look at the line shape itself. Now, line shape is something that's not typically measured from space, right? A Lyman alpha line shape. This is, in fact, the only one I'm aware of. This is from the OGO 5 satellite back in the 60s. Um, this is something I'd like to pursue. I think CubeSats would be a natural platform for this, maybe with an absorption cell or, or even uh, some new instrumentation, some of these spatial heterodyne spectrometers, that kind of thing, would be a, a natural extension of, of continuing this, this work. Uh, but the bottom line is that the velocity distribution of the exospheric hydrogen is very poorly constrained from the line shapes itself. That's something that it basically stopped in the 60s. Density, on the other hand, line radians, the frequency integrated line radiance is measured a lot. So right now, Image and Twins both hold, well, well, Image is defunct, but Twins hosts uh, Lyman Alpha Photometer. All of these satellites were on these uh, Molniya orbits where they have a very high, uh, highly ecliptic orbit, and they essentially stare back at Earth. Um, uh, and it's such that the, they maintain very stable positioning. It does go through the radiation belts twice per orbit, so you, you don't get coverage all the time. You have to turn off your sensor when you go through there. 
Uh, but there's a long time, a 12 hour period, there's many hours per day where they're up here looking back down on the planet. Here's a, essentially, here's a few hours. You can see the spacecraft track here. A few hours of the actual individual lines of sight from a single detector. And each satellite has two detectors. And they, they sit like this and then they spin around. So uh, a lot of data coming from here. The conventional estimation, density estimation, from this optically thin data, though, assumes functional forms. And these are very arbitrary of functional forms. They're very ad hoc. And every study that's released assumes a different functional form, so you can't even compare them very well. Almost all use a power law decay in the mean density. They all use a second order spherical harmonic expansion at the exobase, but then you have to propagate, you know, you don't have a spherical harmonic expansion at each different radial place, right? You have to get those coefficients to apply to different radial dependencies, so then you give the coefficients themselves some radial dependence, and that's where things get a little strange. It could be a power law, it could be a linear dependence, uh, and then it's a matter of fitting those coefficients. And there's typically about 18, 12 to 18 coefficients that you would fit all of this data to. So it's kind of like a, a tomography problem, but it's very much parameterized. The density that you get is going to be model dependent. The fact that you're using a second order harmonic expansion, the second order term varies uh, on quadrant base. Okay, so there's a 90 degree uh, essentially variation that it will accommodate. And any higher order structure, you simply won't pick up with this kind of parameterization. And so what would be really nice is to be able to invert this previous equation, invert this equation uh, using data like this, these overlapping lines of sight, without any assumptions whatsoever. And so this is the approach we're doing at Illinois. Uh, this is a full tomographic estimation approach. The idea is that you discretize your region into a certain number of voxels. The, the density of the voxels, the resolution, could be determined by the amount of overlap you have with your lines of sight. How much duration of data are you using in your sample, in your ensemble? Uh, then you project your unknown density function onto these orthonormal basis functions. You could choose easy ones. In other words, it's one if you're inside the voxel. It's zero if you're out, basically a chronic or delta. Uh, and then you simply replace. This is that, that same, here's an ith measurement. This is that from a, from a given position along your satellite orbit, Ri, looking along a given line of sight, Ni. And then you simply replace the row in your integral equation from above with this discretized expression. And then everything in brackets here is known. This is your basis functions. Uh, this is the scaling parameters, solar flux, cross-section, that sort of thing. Everything in here is known, and it's essentially a function of i and j. So you can write this then as a matrix equation, add Poisson counting noise to it, and then just invert. This is a, a linear expression. So there's lots of signal processing techniques that allow us to invert this. Here is an example of what we've been working on. Here's a predicted density. It's based on some spherical harmonic expansion that twins published, twins analysis. Uh, and then here's our reconstruction of it. Now, in this case, the satellite was moving away from Earth, uh, along the Sun-Earth line. We've looked at various geometries, such as the Molniya orbits. Uh, this is something that is very promising, uh, where we would be able to pick up density structures uh, of very small time scale, uh, small spatial scales. Uh, and we will have to keep you posted on that. Uh, the idea, though, of using twins data for this, twins data would work, but it's not ideal. Uh, we can actually, now that we have, you know, CubeSats have become so predominant, we can actually envision using, uh, designing an ideal mission to do this tomography problem. And so uh, we've done that. This is a, just one slide on, on a proposal uh, that we submitted to the last round of, of NASA Heliophysics CubeSats, where we were taking advantage of the Explorer Mission 1 launch opportunity. This is a, was essentially a translunar uh, trajectory where it was going to go around the moon and then come back. It was a, a test for the for the new interplanetary uh, rocket and the vehicle. Here's the trajectory where it drops us off. You can see this is the magnetopause. So we're going to take it here around 110 hours. We go behind the moon and then enter into a heliocentric orbit. Uh, we were able to maintain communications out to at least 450 hours. That was a, a big deal. That's now possible with CubeSats. Uh, but the idea with this one, though, is that we had a photometer. Here's its field of view, Lyman Alpha photometer, and then we simply rock very, in a very controlled, very slow way. This had, this had a five-minute spin period and a 30-minute nutation period. Very slowly rock the satellite. 
Uh, and because Lyman alpha is so bright, we can have very short integration periods. We had 10 hertz sampling. Uh, and here's a projection. This is five degree resolution. Our actual resolution was 0.1 degree. So we're able, essentially, to image the geocorona, the, this exosphere hydrogen cloud, as you move through it. And that's really the right way to do it, is, is, to, is to do that. But orbits, orbits work, too. And so this is something that we'll be uh, pursuing this kind of platform uh, for that kind of measurement in the future. Uh, limb scanning, though, is the, the most common. So limb scanning geometry uh, for the Lyman alpha sensing, again, this is that, the bright ultraviolet line. Uh, this is something that's been done for a long time, even from rockets uh, had, had limb scanning uh, geometries. The idea is that you have, in this case, this is the, the way Gooby works, you have a spectral graph spectrograph, and then you have a scan mirror that tilts and essentially aims your field of view around. And you tilt it so that you pick up, here's the slit spectrograph here, you slide it so that it's looking along the limb, back down to the disk, and essentially does this, this sort of windshield wiper motion. Uh, and it's along the limb then where you're looking through uh, much of that, that exospheric cloud. As you start looking down into the disk, now you're sampling more of the thermospheric density. And as you look straight down, you're looking down into the mesosphere. So this is a, a way of, of, of looking at the densities at lower altitudes than the twins would give you, twins or image. The problem is that now you're in the multiply scattered regime, optically thick regime. So you need to do radiative transport modeling. This is where it gets tricky. Uh, and the equations look like this. Uh, I imagine the, the concept is fairly familiar. Here's the intensity. Here's its dependence on solar flux. It's still a linear scaling. Uh, in this case, I've changed the integration over the line of sight to be an integration over optical depth. Optical depth is where your density dependence occurs uh, in here. So optical depth is essentially, here's your absorption cross-section, scattering cross-section. Again, it's got that same frequency dependence I talked about. You've got the natural line width and your velocity distribution function convolution here. Uh, and you integrate this over the line of sight. Now, the geometry is interesting. So here we're sitting here at R0 looking back along S. We don't just have a mission coming from R back towards R0. We have a mission coming from R prime. In other words, the source is not just the sun coming from the sun to R back to R0, but the source is anywhere in the medium. And anywhere in the medium is, meanwhile, illuminated by anywhere else in the medium. And so your source function, this is the, the source function saying, where's my illumination coming from? The source is not just the solar flux, but the source is, in fact, uh, itself, right? So this is a, a Fredholm integral equation of the second kind. You can cast this, you essentially solve it in, in the typical way where you discretize the region. In this case, we take advantage of the cylindrical symmetry with solar zenith angle, calculate the single scattering in each zone. You know, the sun, sunlight's coming in, it's going to scatter more or less isotropically, uh, and then perform a path integration of that source then to every other voxel and then cast this as a matrix equation and invert. So the, it's, it's quite time consuming. Uh, the nice thing, and, and part of the reason is because we're, we're doing a spherical model. There's a lot of plane parallel rate of transfer models out there that work just fine for low altitude emissions, uh, you know, near 80, 90 kilometers, 200 kilometers. But when you're talking about a mission that's arising from several Earth radii away, you need to have a spherical geometry. Uh, how do you find the density? Well, uh, it turns out that the radiance along the limb is sensitive to the density. Uh, you can parameterize the density distribution. Here's that typical peak in the MLT. Here's where it comes back up. I, I've, I've truncated this at the exobase, nominally 500 kilometers here. But you can parameterize in a mathematical way. Now, this is not really driven by a lot of physics, but you can parameterize it as a variation in the peak. And I didn't show that because that would have been busy, but essentially it slides. The, the peak density would slide along left to right here, getting large and getting small. A variation in the exobase density. And then that vertical flux, that photochemically initiated vertical flux through the thermosphere that governs the structure, then changes the shape between these two anchors. Uh, so these three parameters are enough to describe the distribution in the thermosphere. If you look at how the rate of transfer model predicts the measured brightness that you would measure, uh, the shape of it, 
uh, it's very sensitive, particularly the exobase density. So this is the, as a function of look angle, okay, so this is look angle from zenith. 90 degrees would be sideways, 180 degrees would be straight down. Some of the look angles range from 90 to 120, or roughly like this. This is the limb scan geometry. So here you're looking at the high altitudes. Here you're looking back towards the disk, essentially. The limb scanning range of Gooby spans between these two lines. And then on the left, off to the, off to the right would be the disk. And you can see tremendous variation in the relative radiance. And, and this is a really crucial concept. You know, if you were looking and saying the absolute radiance that you measure, and we'll go back to that equation, the absolute radiance that you measure is proportional to the solar flux. It's also, of course, crucially dependent on your instrument calibration. But it's the shape that's sensitive to these parameters. So we do away with any dependence on calibration, any unknowns potentially in the solar flux, that linear scaling factor, and simply by looking at the shape of the limb scan, of the limb profile of this radiance, we can deduce the hydrogen density. The idea would be to find the best fit parameters that best represent our uh, emission that we observe. Now, what I'm showing here is uh, the trouble is there's two issues, really. One is that treatment in the Earth's shadow is very hard. Obviously, there's no single scattering that takes place in the dark side. Uh, it's only multiple scattering, and it's easy enough to turn off that term. But the shadow itself is something that spans a, a very, uh, has large gradients, let's put it that way. And the model doesn't. The model voxels are actually quite large to, in order to maintain computational efficiency. So the shadow right now is something that's not dealt with very well. Uh, meanwhile, the satellite atoms is another problem. How do you parameterize those? Those happen above the exobase. What we found right now is that we have a way of, of modeling those with some parameters much like this, uh, but the sensitivities are not well behaved to where it's very easy to find uh, a set that fits. And I'll show you what I mean. So here's Gooby data. So on the day side, we're, we're not going to worry about the shadow right now, only on the day side solar max versus solar min. At solar min, ion densities are, bound to, are, are going to be larger, so you're going to have more charge exchange, more satellite atoms. At solar maximum, lower ion densities, more thermal evaporation over this charge exchange uh, contribution. And so you, you don't expect a lot of satellite contribution. So here is the data is in red in both cases. MSIS, by the way, that the, the neutral density model that was developed assuming charge exchange equilibrium, predicts this gray line right here, way off, way off in both cases. Um, but what I've done here, this is the best fit in terms of the parameters. You can see that uh, this is for a given exobase density for, uh, in this, I didn't fit the, the peak density because we'd, we're only using limb data here. But for a given exobase density, there's in fact two different values of the flux that, that did a good job here. Uh, and they're very closely related, between 5 and 6 times 10 to the 7. Usually the flux that's adopted in models is double that. So already we've halved our escape flux uh, with this estimation. Uh, I, didn't, I don't show it here, but the MSIS density drastically overestimates the uh, exobase in particular. This grade, these are the altitude profiles associated generating these curves in the model. The black ones are the two that best fit our data. You can see there's really no difference at all. But MSIS is the gray curve here, uh, has, a, has a very hard time through the, this region between 100 and 200 kilometers, and then again up at the exabase uh, around 450. It, it's pretty bad. Uh, at solar minimum, now we have problems. There is no set of parameters that best fits the data. They, they all do a terrible job. If you want to look at thermal evaporation only, uh, that's this black, this black curves down here. It just keeps decaying and keeps falling off. Okay, our data definitely does not do that. There's this turnaround. Radiance increases. In other words, you're looking down at the disk. It's low. Now you're looking at the peak H density. It gets high, and then you start looking. It gets low again, but then it gets high again as you look far enough away. So you're looking along these very grazing incidences along the limb, and we're seeing our our radiance start increasing, 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 as if the density is larger at large distances than you would think. Now, where does that come from? It's satellite atoms. They're in these bound orbits that have perigees above the exobase. So how do we deal with those satellite atoms? Uh, you know, what do they even look like? How do you do it? Well, the parameterization that might work, here's a curve that doesn't fit this one right here. It fits at those high altitude limb scans, 
with the high altitude tangent point, but not at the low altitude. Uh, the ones that fit down at low altitudes don't fit at high altitudes. It, basically, it's a problem. So uh, this is something that we're, we're working on quite a bit now. Here you can see the significant difference that, that this is implying. The thermal evaporation falls off here. That's this curve that just, I'm, I'm too far away. That's this curve down here that just keeps going down. This is the satellite population. You can see it's significantly larger distances at these, uh, higher densities at these large distances. So this is an, an active area of research where we're working on a better way of, of parameterizing the satellite population so that we can invert it in the radiative transfer sense. And, and the reason we're so keen to do this, if you look at the data itself, this is all the Gooby data right here, Lyman Alpha data. There's some beautiful climatologies here. It's just, we're just waiting to pull it out. Uh, this is a, the colors are solar cycle, blue is solar minimum, red is solar maximum. There's a clear variation here. If you go back to the sensitivity I showed, this is a low solar density, this is a high, or, or low hydrogen density, this is high hydrogen density. Uh, this kind of behavior where the radiance simply increases as you look at higher altitudes, as a larger radiance than if you look at lower altitudes in the, where the density is actually higher, this is something that uh, the model doesn't do, uh, doesn't reproduce whatsoever. And the theory is that it's because it's spherically symmetric. So this is where the rate of transfer model right now assumes that the hydrogen distribution is spherically symmetric around the planet, when in fact we know, so the spherical symmetry is the green lines, we know that the contours have much more of a, of a tail distribution. And so here's the gooby field of view. This would be the lines of sight for this one. These are the lines of sight for this one. These are our lines of sight for, for over here, where you're looking completely in the shadow at low altitudes. Uh, this kind of uh, shape is, because it's generated by the satellite atom filling up this region, this is something that uh, we need to do a better job before we can start deriving densities on, on the night side, uh, and even at solar minimum. So this is a, you know, something we'll, we'll keep going with. Uh, just in the, in the last minute or so, I, uh, I want to talk about the very last something that's been done for decades. Uh, it's, it's one thing to deploy an instrument in space. Um, it's not going to happen very often. Uh, timed, in particular, has, is now defunct. Its, span, its uh, scanning mirror is stuck in one position, so it's no longer generating limb scans. The past and probably the future is going to be with ground-based sensing. Uh, it's just the way it is. And so currently, a, a lot of the sensing, the conventional sensing is, is interferometric. It uses fiber pro interferometers. Here's a typical fringe pattern. And the nice thing about that is that you can get the line profile from the ground. Uh, this, even though the visible wavelength is optically thin, it's generated by the resonant fluorescence of an optically thick line and beta line. So you still need to do a radiative transfer. Uh, that ends up being pretty tricky, particularly if you're trying to get something besides full width half max in terms of effective temperature. In other words, if you're trying to actually say, what's my velocity distribution function, it varies along the line of sight, right? Even if you assume it's Maxwellian, it's not isothermal everywhere along your line of sight. So having the conventional viewing geometry where you have a single sensor viewing almost always in the zenith, and then just sitting there looking zenith all night long, this is the way it's been done. And right now, we have this beautiful climatology of the Balmer alpha radiance and Balmer alpha line widths, but there's, it's very ambiguous as to how you convert that into knowledge about the distribution functions of the hydrogen themselves. So the, the last thing that I'm involved in, this is a, a NSF career award uh, that I was awarded this past year, is to create an array of ground-based sensors. And so the idea is that you would have four, maybe six. You know, We'll do an optimization problem here and decide how many we need. But you'll have, right here, it's showing four. You'll have a, an array of photometers. And, and we're measuring the frequency integrated. You know, we're not going to worry about line width right now. We just want radiance and density. Have an array of photometers all looking in different directions so that as the Earth spins, you would then have essentially a tomography problem where you optimize the overlap around this 1,000 kilometer region where charge exchange and thermal evaporation are, are going to be competitive. And this is the, you know, we're hoping that we would be able to untangle the fraction of atoms that are in the satellite populations, the fractions that are in 
ballistics, uh, ballistic orbits and the fraction that are escaping dynamically just from knowing the density and using the, the rate of transfer model on that. So, uh, you know, we're optimistic that this is something that, that has a, a great future. Uh, just in, in the conclusions, um, the idea here is that, you know, I hope I've convinced you that we need to keep pursuing sensing techniques. They're, they're very challenging, uh, but they're very useful to advance the modeling, physics-based modeling, uh, and which have uh, a large impact on numerous uh, solar terrestrial problems in solar terrestrial research. Uh, the capabilities themselves, we're, we're really at a turning point here. Uh, we've got distributed sensing that's, that's becoming very cost efficient. We've got CubeSat deployment so we can do more from space. Uh, meanwhile, we've got high performance computing so we can have high resolution, spherically asymmetric radiative transfer models. This is something that couldn't have been done in the past. Uh, and then meanwhile, uh, the fact that you know, so far all of the initiatives have been very isolated. You have the Balmer Alpha ground-based group just doing Balmer Alpha ground-based. You've got the limb scan group just doing limb scan. Twins, uh, optically thin analysis, they only use their twins data. So I think the future is really to combine, you know, use SABRE as a low altitude boundary. Use the twins as a high altitude boundary to constrain the, the, the limb scan data, for instance. And on the night side, where it's complicated in the shadow, use the Balmer Alpha data to, to help constrain that solution as well. So this is where we're headed. Uh, this is a very much a team effort. Uh, it's not just me involved in this. Uh, on the tomography side, there's Farzad Kamalabadi. David Wren, by the way, he's an undergraduate who, who's doing that tomography problem for us um, at UIUC. Uh, Larry Paxson uh, with the timed Gooby and the DSSP SUSY data at APL. Bob Kerr, John Noto, they, they really got me started. Uh, in this area, and Ed Mirkowitz at Embry-Riddle is doing a lot of the, the ground-based interferometry. Uh, and of course, James Bishop and Joseph Chamberlain uh, led the way. It's a lot of their, their classic papers that have uh, motivated a lot of this work uh, for the past several decades. So I'll stop there, and thanks for listening. More questions for Laura? Um, I have two questions. It was very nice talk. First off, what fraction of the hydrogen atoms in the exosphere do you think are shadow light? So that work's been done. Uh, well, simulations have been done. And if you believe them, uh, it's anywhere from 50% to a majority, vast majority. It depends on what altitude you're talking about. So exosphere is anything above the exobase. Uh, if you're saying exosphere above 3RE, it's probably 80-90%. If it's exosphere at 1,000 kilometers, 40% to 50%, depending on solar cycle. Could be as low as 5% if it's solar maximum, for instance. It, it, it's very uh, climatology dependent and, and altitude dependent. My other question was for the um, tomographic technique. What do you think your time resolution will be like? Per, per day? That's a great question. Uh, so if if we're using twins data, for instance, uh, we would have enough. So, so our simulations so far have all been 2D. Twins is obviously a 3D problem. And so the lines of sight through the 3D are more sparse. So it would take more data than it would if you're doing a 2D where all your lines of sight are in the same plane. Uh, but nonetheless, you get two sensors and you have, in fact, it's four sensors. Uh, based on our preliminary calculations, we think we can have an estimate within a few hours. Right now, that's on the order of what they're doing. So in other words, you take all of the data as the satellites transit one of those uh, along their apogee. The problem is that uh, when one of them is on the apogee, the other one is not necessarily on its apogee. And so you, you and, and meanwhile, you know, it could be down in the radiation belt since you only get one satellite, it's not stereoscopic anymore. When there's good viewing conditions from both looking back down, uh, that coincidence is not that often. That's why the, the twins geometry is not the ideal. We're still trying to think of CubeSat missions with better observing geometries. Uh, that coincidence, my understanding is, it's seasonally dependent, uh, but it's on the order of a few days every couple weeks, something like that. So we might get lucky and see some storm time evolution. Uh, I should mention that the tomographic concept, it's, it lends itself to a time 
state-dependent analysis. In other words, you don't have to have your underlying state parameter, the density, be static in time. You can allow it, you can give it a, a parameter, for instance, if you wanted to parameterize it, but you could allow it to vary in time and then estimate that as well, that variation as part of your output not just the, the static density field. So, but so far, we've, we've considered it as static as, as an initial part to the problem. Scratch my head. We have similar problems with the chromosphere and corona of the sun. Transition region. Um, and it's a ubiquitous problem in yeah. space. And just this transition from where you see that turnaround and the distribution function where it seems to, like, it should be going away, but it actually creeps back up again. Oh, interesting. Um, but the, the kind of key to solving that problem was spectral resolution. <laughs> so you're seeing actually multi-component plasma, right? So you try, if you don't, so it was going to lead to my question of, if, do you have more Lyman alpha spectra that you can combine with the measurements to see if there's secondary populations out there, because my bet would be that those satellites probably give you enough of a signal to to be able to decouple the you know decompose the line profiles. But if those are extremely rare, then you've got a really outpost problem in, out on your hands. And so, those are extremely rare. Uh, as I mentioned, the I I have plans in the in the works. Essentially, I'm I'm cooking up a, a way of of deploying a new sensor. Interferometry in space is really tough. Mm -hmm. um, but having a, a fused silicate type instrument, a, a spatial heterodyne spectrometer, for instance, would allow for UV sensing of, of the emission line shape. Um, it's As far as I know, it's only been measured in the optically thin environment. And I've personally done forward modeling using different distribution functions, sums of Maxwellians, a hot and a cold one, or a kappa distribution function to see the effect it has on the line yeah. shape. Yeah. The line shape still looks pretty Gaussian. It only changes it at the extremely wings, like the, the wings, essentially. And maybe even only one wing? And, and maybe even only one wing. Yeah. Uh, because so I, used, I, I used uh, an isotropic distribution, but of course the distribution's not isotropic. You, have a, you don't have an incoming component, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so to do it properly, you would have an asymmetric, anisotropic velocity distribution, uh, and forward model your line profile, and then try to find those those parameters. Certainly, if you're going to take that line profile and, and that ensemble of photons, and then multiply scatter them, that line profile is, it, of course, potentially prohibitively hard. I don't want to say it's impossible, but. Uh, it, it'll be it'll be a while, I think, before anyone anyone tries to chew on that one. Uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, there's there's a paper Berto did a very good job of of showing how the velocity distribution function actually needs to be projected along the line of sight, even in optically thin case, to do that properly. Uh, but you're right, it's it's a very hard problem, which is why the the modeling comes in where if we knew the densities everywhere then we could back out that the densities here in these asymmetries are caused by you know, charge exchange population of satellite orbits. That tells you something about the velocity distribution function. You don't need to measure the line shape yeah, yeah. to infer it. And that's, that's where we're going. We're after the density. If we can measure the density well enough and accurately enough, uh, we think we can interpret that in terms of dynamically what put those populations at those places. It's hard. It's a hard problem. So at the earlier you showed that the model is overestimating the population for the density. Is that because it, they didn't consider the uh, uh, charge exchange? They did consider charge exchange. What's the cause of the overestimation? There's not enough data to tell. That's the problem. So w what you were looking at is the only comparison that exists. There, you know, and that's that's all that they have. So. Uh, we have data. Right now, the hydrogen density estimation is limited to 90 kilometers with SABER. And it's limited to beyond 3RE from twins. And there's no, not a single estimate in between, with the exception of the, the limb scan Gooby, my work, which is, which is one estimate, basically. So it's, it's a, pr a proof of concept. You know, we're, we're currently working on the climatology uh, in a systematic way. Uh, but until then, there's a gap region where hydrogen density 
has never been measured. Oh, but, but I mean, Directly, the reliably. The, the measurement that emphasis is based on is this charge of gain technique. But it assumes and, equilibrium. Which has, which has various assumptions, and right. not to mention the rate coefficients and, and sure. the various model assumptions that go into that. And, and your estimates are, uh, are about two thirds. That's true. Uh, or that is to say, it looks 50% high or so right. compared to Boomi for your uh, analysis. So, so um, that's, uh, that, that, that reveals, I think that reveals shortcomings in emphasis, but, but given the methodology that that was based on, it, it seems to me that that's within, within the uncertainties I would expect. Certainly, and, and keep in mind the the emphasis. You know, even if you say charge exchange equilibrium was valid, those estimates were acquired along a spacecraft trajectory. That trajectory was around 250 kilometers. Projecting it down in altitude and projecting it up in altitude were both done in a fairly ad hoc way. And there, and so other, there's, other, there's other evidence that points to emphasis having some some overestimation of the thermosphere, mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. which is what it's after. It doesn't pretend to know what's in the exosphere. So uh, I think I think it, it's, it's it's on a convergent path. Uh, the perplexing thing I think is the solar min data you showed and, and how difficult it is to have any density profile that will match the observed brightness profile, which I hadn't been aware of before. But, but I, I I'm wondering if that may come down to the radiation. Well, you know, my, so my theory, and this is something we'll actually have results on pretty soon, my theory is that it's because it's spherically symmetric. So if you, if you look at the, say, take this slide aside over here, okay, you see it's, it's increasing at high look, large look angles. So large look angle is, this, is the right-hand side as opposed to the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, if you take it spherically symmetric, you're really underestimating the density that's here versus, you know, the actual tail you're, you're contour. The, this is noon. That's true. This is at noon right here. And, and there's at solar minimum, there's a little increase here. So here's the, here's the cone on the other side of the Earth, and here's where that would be, that would be an issue. Uh, but there's no guarantee this is not necessarily a solar min or a solar max. In other words, um, there's not necessarily a guarantee that this is what it actually looks like. But solar min, the densities are high. Exobase densities are higher so than, path, than at solar max. So, you're, you got right there. so your path becomes short, and, and, and the deficit is, is, at, is at fairly high compression angles. Now you're looking like 20 degrees below the horizontal. So you, I don't think you're, you're likely to be seeing very far past the transient pole. Well, th that's correct. That's correct. But the the issue is at what altitude do these uh, local time variations exist? You know, to assume that, that they, they disappear at low altitudes, I think, is, is, is probably a, a mistake. In other words, um, you know, so the, the Monte Carlo model, for instance, predicted that there's going to be a dawn dusk asymmetry of the order factor of two or so um, at the exobase. And then by within one RE, it's completely gone, and there's no more dawn dusk asymmetry. Whereas if you look at these contours, there's a dawn dusk asymmetry up to a factor of 10, measured by twins, out to 3, 4, 5, 10 RE. And so you say, well, how does that transition back? Twins can't give you anything inside of 3 RE without having to do the rate of transfer problem, which they're not touching, apparently, with a 10-foot pole. So uh, there's no data here uh, that hasn't been looked at. And so the question is, you know, what happens with these uh, with these asymmetries, is there uh, violations of spherical symmetry that might account for this behavior, even if, as you say, and I agree with you, this behavior is not necessarily coming from this out here, uh, but there could be, exactly, there could be asymmetries near the tangent. The first step, as I was suggesting, was uh, how the contribution function. Absolutely. Yep, I agree. That's a good next step. Yeah. As a historical note, weren't some of the early uh, uh, estimates of hydrogen density coming from the big inflated 
inflatable satellites at a thousand kilometers. So just measuring the total mass density of the atmosphere. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not so aware of. I'm not that familiar with those. Uh, that would certainly work. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Sure, sure. That would make a lot of sense. Uh, that hydrogen's been the dominant. There's not, and, and I've thought about about doing it. There's not. Uh, there's an excellent review, and I meant to mention it actually uh, by Far and Shizgal. Uh, there's an excellent review of theories uh, of the physics, essentially, of what's going on with hydrogen. Uh, there's not very many reviews of observations of hydrogen, uh, a comprehensive, you know, all in one place type thing. So I'll have to look into that. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. But that would be a, a good resource if that data is still available. Sure. And it's not closed door, right? No, no everyone's welcome. Okay. All okay. the engineering aspects of Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.